Hi, this is Chavista Chronicles from Caracas, number 13. My name is Jesus Rodriguez. This week uh, I want to talk to you about uh, what I call anti-Chavismo laws in, in space. Then I want to talk about uh, how Chavistas in Venezuela are seeing uh, these recent uh, events in uh, Latin America. And I want to end up talking a little bit about our Orinoco Tribune anniversary. So let's start from the beginning. I mean, uh, when I said anti-Chavismo lost in space, I'm basically talking about three things. Uh, first, uh, what I called Guaido attacks from all flanks. I mean, by now Guaido is being attacked by their supporters, uh, politicians uh, within the right-wing movement in Venezuela, influencers in social media. I mean, they attack him in a daily basis, and I'm happy uh, because of that, uh, because that guy is a joke. Uh, but anyway, I mean, uh, it's important for you to, to know that that is happening. Uh, in Venezuela right now in relation to Guaido and what anti-Chavismo represents. So um, in that context of Chavismo lost, anti-Chavismo lost in space, uh, uh, there's this discussion uh, about the new uh, electoral council board. So right now that's one of the most active issues in uh, political issues in Venezuela. So right-wingers, I mean, I'm talking about Guaido and the group of uh, deputies that accompany him uh, tried to make some noise this last week about it and saying that somehow saying that they're about to name, which is impossible because the National Assembly is in contempt. So, so they are going to name the new board of the of the electoral council uh like threatening i don't know how that they are going to do that when they know that they are in contempt and that the for the last appointments has been made by the supreme court which have the constitutional right to do it if the national assembly doesn't so that's what has been happening. I mean, the best solution, if you ask me, is that the right wing bench and the PSUV and the Chavista bench uh, join an agreement in order to get the National Assembly out of contempt and that way moving on in selecting a new uh, electoral council. But, and that's one of the promises, or at least maybe not promises, but expectations of this new uh, national dialogue table that was uh, 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 reached a few weeks ago between the government and some minorities opposition parties. So that table is working on those issues. But if you ask me, I believe that they are working slowly. And if you ask me, I believe that not even Chavismo and neither the right-wingers are trying to find communication with the other side of the table, which is the right-wingers. I mean, the extreme right-wingers that are around the idea of Guaido and the regime chain of operation led, led by the U.S. using Guaido and that kind of thing. I, I believe that that's the best solution, but I don't see that... Uh, Politically talking, we are moving towards that direction, and that, if you ask me, is not a good sign. So um, uh, that's talking about the Electoral Council. Uh, and, and another issue uh, referring to anti-Chavismo laws in space is the, this new mega protest, mega demonstration call for November the 26th. And again, it's going to be like the 8th or 10th 
uh, mega final demonstration, and they are trying to, as I've been saying in recent podcasts, they have been trying to heat up the street, but they cannot do it. They they don't have enough strength to do that. And I'm not saying that, you know, the anti-Chavistas join Chavismo. That is not happening. Uh, but the anti-Chavista base is like tired of their leadership, but also they are tired of the Chavista leadership, of course. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that uh, the political pressure is still there, and that's... Uh, uh, the last point that I want to mention, which is that risk of, I mean, if that tension is still there and rises, uh, and there, and, and we Chavistas do not open political, you know, escape valves, uh, maybe we might put at risk the stable situation that we have achieved for the last, I don't know, 12 months. I mean, maybe not 12 months, but, but, six, eight months. So so we I believe that we Chavistas need to pay attention to that. Uh and of course from outside Venezuela uh, our friends have I believe to try to push towards that direction. And I believe that the best way to do it is using the national dialogue table trying to bring in maybe we cannot, you know, bring them all but an important chunk of the right wingers that are not, are not there, and maybe that way uh, we might reach the agreements needed in order to get the national assembly out of content, and then trying to choose an electoral board that is needed urgently in order for you know calling for the parliamentary elections that are that has to be uh, uh, done uh, in 2020, but also in the case of a presidential early election, if that happens, in, in that scenario, we will need also to have a balanced, uh, more you know, recognized uh, electoral council board. So uh, that's what I wanted to mention about the the anti-Chavismo lost, it, lost in space. I believe that Chavista forces are getting stronger, but there's a risk. There's a risk uh, uh, of not act if we Chavistas do not act responsibly. Uh, we might face like an explosion, maybe not in one month or two months, but maybe in three or four months. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, also, I, I wanted to talk today about the, how Chavistas, how we Chavistas look, what is happening in the continent. I'm talking about Latin America, of course, and the uh, uprisings in Haiti, Ecuador, and Chile. I mean, we Chavistas in Venezuela uh, see those events like with hope for a change. Of course, each one have their own you know, peculiarities, but uh, in general, I mean, we are excited about, you know, realizing that there's like popular will. I mean, there's a people's will uh, uh, in order to provoke a change in countries that has been implementing neoliberal measures or are just, you know, puppets of the U.S. like Ecuador, Chile, or Haiti. So we are happy that that's happening, and that of course have a lot of influence. I mean that that raised our spirit in from one side, but also that raised awareness among right wingers about the necessity, at least my, that's my perspective, the necessity of not going crazy implementing. Uh, neoliberal decisions, economic decisions, like the ones that they have been implemented, or playing the puppet game that they love to play, at least those countries that belong to the Lima group, for example. If I was one of the leaders of, of those countries that always uh, play what the U.S. instruct me to do, I would be uh, very careful knowing 
that uh, an uprising in my country might happen one day or the other. So from my perspective, that's positive. Of course, from the right right wing perspective, they are trying to use that like 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 the ghost of of the chavismo, uh, like promoting uprisings and destabilizing the whole continent and things like that. They are using that in their advantage, but I believe that they, I mean, that strategy is basically uh, going nowhere, which is a fact. Is the analysis from the left. Uh, that is the one that I just mentioned. So we're happy about what happened in, in, in those countries. Haiti, of course, is interesting because, I mean, the situation there is chaotic. And there, I, I don't see, at least from what we're reporting, Orinoco Tribune, uh, an escape, a solution uh, 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 about to come. So it's anguishing. Uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but but I believe that that we have to give the Haitian people all the solidarity needed and push our governments in order to provoke some sort of solution in Haiti because I don't see any sort of solution there, and and that reality can only create more humanitarian a bigger humanitarian crisis in Haiti. In Ecuador, of course, if you ask me, I believe that what CONAE did negotiating with Lenin Moreno was a mistake, uh, and and the, the mobilization of all the indigenous and peoples that were confronting Lenin Moreno was a mistake, but I believe, as Atilio Boron said in a wonderful article that he wrote a few days after that agreement, uh, I believe that if sooner or later, more sooner than later, uh, the Equatorian people, and we have start seeing uh, signs that that's going to happen. I mean, the Equatorian people are going to rise again and get rid of Lenny Moreno because everyone knows that that guy, that you cannot reach an agreement with a guy that do not have a word. So that's my perspective on, Ch on Ecuador. And talking about Chile, we are very, like, I mean, disregarding that the situation in Chile is more complex because, uh, at least from my perspective, from what we have read, uh, the right wing, I mean, the left in Chile <coughs> do not have enough support. They have not been doing their work properly, uh, even in the... And, and the whole uprising do not have like a visible head. Uh, we are ha we are happy because we have been listening lately that uh, people in the streets are asking for a constitutional, a new constitution, a constitution, a constituent assembly, and that's something that is very. Uh, appealing for us the Chavista because the Bolivarian process, the Chavista process started with a new constitution. So so we are very uh, inspired by that request from the people in the streets of Chile. So we hope to see uh, and we see that they don't get tired of, you know, protesting and confronting the repressive uh, police in Chile, military. Uh, so we are happy about that. But also we have those electoral resources in Bolivia, in Argentina, which is great. I mean, having Argentina back into the left, and we have seen uh, Daniel Fernandez uh, traveling to Mexico and organizing already international meetings of leftist countries. I believe that Argentina, the new president of Argentina, Daniel Fernandez, uh, among Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, are going to try to revive the the good uh, regional bodies that were created during Chavez time, like UNASUR or CELAC. So I believe that we're going to start seeing, you know, those bodies uh, being more active in recent months or years. So the electoral resort in Uruguay is also positive, uh, even though everyone says that the second one is going to be hard on on 
on the candidate of Frente Amplio, uh, when you analyze the results of the first round, you and you compare it with the, what the polls were saying in, in the months before the election, uh, the electoral result of Frente Amplio was very positive. I mean, it was the most positive uh, was similar to the most optimistic scenario drawn by polls before the election. So I believe that it's not impossible if Frente Amplio and the leftist uh, organizations in Uruguay work together and work effectively in the next few weeks that they might have a, a good electoral resource uh, on uh, November the 24th. I believe that that's going to be the second round. So let's see what happens. But if that happens, we are going to have like several countries in the region backed uh, into the left. And uh, the other one, very scary of having rebellions, of people's rebellions in their countries because of the unpopularity of their policies. So uh, we're very proud of that, and at the same time, there are, you know, social problems and protests in Colombia with the students and in Panama uh, with uh, people uh, against constitutional reforms. So, so we are very optimistic and encouraged and with high spirit because of what is happening in Latin America in recent weeks. So let's see what happens. And just to end uh, this podcast, I just want to remind you, on Sunday, the 24th, at 4 p.m. Caracas time, we are going to have our live stream on Facebook, celebrating Orinoco Tribune's anniversary. First, Our first year, we have been, uh, in less than a year, reaching... Uh, a wide audience of readers from English-speaking countries mostly, uh, but uh, we have been ranked uh, among the best uh, in our niche, of course, uh, websites uh, with progressive information in English about Venezuela, but also about the global South, Latin America especially, but also we try to cover issues in Africa in, in in the Middle East and and sometimes in in Asia, which is we we need to improve that coverage. But we want to see you there. We want you to help us spread in the world about our, our anniversary. Uh, suggesting us things to uh, during the we already posted in Facebook events in our web page, in Facebook page. We posted uh, and we created an event. So we ask you to go there and, and join us in order for, you know, don't miss it, to put it in your calendar, uh, because we want to interact with you. We want to hear your suggestions, your recommendations, the things that you like, that you don't like. We also uh, want to try to update you with, with some current events in Venezuela and the region, but that's what we want. We want to interact with you in order to make Orinoco Tribune even better. So um, thank you again for listening to us. Please help us with the donation spree that this week uh, uh, start moving again. So we need to do that because on the 24 or the 26, I believe, we have to renew our services and we, we are going to need some money to pay for those services. So please help us with that, and we hope to see you then. Bye-bye.